Hello, my name is John Derigi. I'm an application engineer with Keysight Technologies, and during the course of this video, I'd like to review with you the steps that are required to perform a jitter transfer measurement using the 86100D option 400. There's a number of required pieces to complete the measurement. Um, there's some software required. We'll have to have the Keysight IL libraries installed. This can be downloaded from www.keysight.com slash find slash IL libraries. We'll also need to have the 86100D Option 400 Jitter Transfer Workbook. This can be downloaded also from Keysight.com at www.keysight.com and then the upper right hand search window if we search under 86100DU slash 400 uh, the required download will come up as the first link. Uh, finally we need to have Microsoft Excel installed on the control PC. This is used uh, to open the workbook in and it's a basis for all the measurements that are being taken place. The hardware that's required for the measurement will be the 86100D, and in this case we'll use the 86108A or B module. Uh, we're using the 86108A and B to measure the jitter that's being injected by the N4903B Jaybird, uh, and we'll measure the jitter both before and after the device in order to develop the jitter transfer curve. Uh, an important point is that other instruments can also be used. Uh, for the most current up-to-date list of instruments, please contact Keysight Technologies to understand which pieces of equipment can also be used to perform the jitter transfer measurement. Uh, the jitter transfer measurement is a two-step measurement. Uh, the first step requires that we calibrate the jitter transfer, and so we connect the Jaybird directly to the input of the 86108. Uh, the Excel workbook located on the control PC automatically steps the Jaybird through each of the modulation frequencies that we're going to inject onto the data signal in order to characterize the jitter transfer response of the device. Once we calibrate the injected jitter that will be injected into the device, uh, the second step of the measurement is actually to connect up the device and then measure uh, the jitter at the output of the device. Again, there's a series of discrete tones, uh, jitter tones that are being injected into the PL under test. And then by knowing the, the ratio of the output to input jitter, uh, we can report the jitter transfer. And that's exactly what's happening in the Excel workbook. And again, in the second step of the measurement, we're characterizing the jitter at the output of the device. Once the measurement is complete, we'll have a jitter transfer function that's shown similar to the one we see right here. Uh, the blue data points that are part of the jitter transfer plot are the measured data points. Uh, we fit a model to the measured data points, uh, and that's the red line that's shown. Uh, and the typical results that uh, engineers are interested in from the jitter transfer measurement are shown in the lower left-hand corner. There's a 3 dB bandwidth a peaking value uh, that are characteristics of the PLL that's being measured. And we need to know both of these data points to understand um, whether the PLL passes or fails the required jitter measurements. And so we've talked about the measurement steps that are required to perform a jitter transfer measurement. Uh, before going through the mechanics of using the Option 400 workbook, we should quickly talk about how the 86108 is performing the, the jitter measurement. In the lower left-hand corner is a block diagram of the 86108. You can see the signals at the input of the module pass through a, a pickoff, which feeds most of the signal to the wideband samplers and a portion of the signal to the hardware clock recovery. Uh, there's also a precision time base, but the important point for the jitter transfer measurement is we're only using hardware that's part of the hardware clock recovery included in the 86108. There's a more detailed block diagram of what the hardware clock recovery looks like. The main point is to perform the jitter transfer measurement, we're measuring the phase error voltage out of the phase detector and digitizing that with an ADC. So we're essentially looking at baseband jitter, digitizing it with a lower speed ADC, and then converting that to the frequency domain to find the peak and the magnitude for each of the jitter tones that we're injecting as part of the JTF measurement. One more point is that there's a step generator in the hardware for the 86108. This is used to calibrate the impulse response, which is de-embedded from the final measurement so that we get the most accurate measurement of the jitter tone both before the device under test and then after the device under test. And so at this point, I'd like to work through the mechanics of setting up a jitter transfer measurement using the Excel workbook and viewing the results. After you've downloaded and installed the jitter transfer software, we should see an icon on the desktop looking similar to this. We can open it up, and a folder appears that has all of the jitter transfer workbooks loaded. 
Many of these, any that have a PCIe in the start of the file name, are specific to PCI Express Jitter Transfer Compliance Testing. Um, and I'm not going to be going through these today. I'll work with the core measurement workbook, which is the 86100 underscore 400. And so I can open up the file. And you'll see there's a number of things that we need to set up in order to start the measurement. Uh, the first piece is to make sure we properly put the instrument addresses into the workbook so it knows how to communicate with each instrument. This is set up in the first part of the workbook shown here at the top. A quick way to get this set up is to open up the Keysight Connection Expert, which manages all the instrument connections. You can see I have a connection to both an 86100D and an N4903B, and it lists what the IP address is for each instrument. And so I need to change the I.O. port, which is configured in the workbook, to TCP IP0. For both the 86100 and also for the JBIRT. And then I need to enter the IP address for the 86100. And likewise for the N4903B. And that completes the configuration for each of the instrument addresses. The next piece to set up right down below is a clock recovery setup. And there's three parameters we need to provide here. One is the data rate. In this case, I'm going to be measuring a 10 gig PLL. So I set the data rate to 10 gigabit per second. Uh, we also need to configure the loop bandwidth. Um, and this set setting actually is important to think about for a minute. Uh, we need to make sure that when we set up the 86108 loop bandwidth, that it's set to the minimum value for a given data rate. And in this case, I'm setting it to 200 kilohertz for a 10 gig data rate. The final piece to set up is the input that I'm going to be using on the 86108, and I have a differential signal going in, so I just use diff, but there are a couple of different options that are available as you hover over the cell. For the calibration, I'm going to leave everything to the default value in the measurement setup, and we can move down to the jitter transfer portion of the workbook to set up things specific to the JTF measurement. We can specify the start frequency. I'll keep this at 200 kilohertz. We need to tell the workbook the stop frequency, and these are the start and stop frequencies for the discrete jitter tones that are being injected as part of the measurement. I'm going to change this to uh, 15 megahertz. We can tell the workbook how many data points per decade we'd like to have it measure, and I'll keep it to the default value of 15. Uh, we can provide the amplitude of the jitter tone that's being injected, and I'll keep this to the default value of 0.1 UI. Um, an important piece is the clock source for the JBERT needs to be defined. I'll keep this at 10 gigahertz because that's the PLL data rate that I'm going to be measuring. And then finally, we need to specify what patterns are being used for the measurement. And again, I'll keep the default values at PRBS7 for both the calibration, which is specified here in cell D24, and also for the measurement, which is specified in D24. We need to think a little bit more about the patterns we're using if we're going to be doing PCI Express compliance testing, and this is detailed in the shell workbooks that control that part of the measurement. So after setting the various parameters for the calibration, I can select Calibrate Jitter Transfer, uh, but before I hit the Calibrate Jitter Transfer button, there's two things that I'd like to emphasize. Uh, the first is that we need to make sure that the 86100D has the classic GUI active, and that's shown right here uh, in the screen. There's two GUIs that might be installed on the 86100. One's the new N1010A Flex DCA GUI, which is used for most measurements these days, um, but the Jitter Transfer Workbook interfaces with uh, the classic GUI. So we need to make sure that a GUI which looks similar to what I'm showing here is active. Um, the second piece I want to emphasize is a helpful troubleshooting utility, if you get error messages in the Excel Workbook, is to open up the Keysight IO Monitor so we can understand which commands might be causing problems for either the JBERT or the DCA. Sometimes the Excel workbook messages aren't very specific, and looking behind the scenes to see what commands are being sent and where errors occur can provide useful troubleshooting information. Um, so I'll keep this open while I start the workbook. I'll select Calibrate Jitter Transfer, and I can start capturing messages. We should see Skippy commands fly by. Uh, the very first part of the measurement is we're generating a step and measuring the impulse response of the 86108 CDR so that we can de-embed this from the measurement to get the most accurate results. And that's the part of the measurement we're working through right now. 
And then the very final portion of the jitter transfer calibration is to have the Jaybird inject a jitter tone and have the 86108 measure each jitter tone. Since we've already established connectivity and are making a measurement successfully, I'll turn off um, the Keysight IO monitor. And once we get to the end of the measurement, the final jitter point's measured, and you can see the entire curve is normalized to 0 dB. And so this will be our reference point for the measurement in order to determine the jitter transfer function. At this point, we can connect up the device under test and make some measurements. Point I've disconnected the inputs to the 86108. I've connected that to the device input and then connected the device output to the input of the 86108. Uh, before we start the jitter transfer measurement, one quick point uh, which is useful as a troubleshooting step is there are a couple of cells in the measurement setup that can help uh, troubleshoot problems that you might observe during a jitter transfer measurement. Uh, probably the most important cell is cell D17, which enables the user to uh, have a prompt appear before each measurement point. Uh, so we can ensure A, that the device is locked, and B, that there's a signal coming out of the device into the 86108. This is a problem which occurs sometimes, and by entering a value in cell C17, um, it's a useful troubleshooting step to isolate where the problem occurs and make sure you're able to get a good measurement. Um, in this case, I'm just going to run it without any prompts uh, to have it move through quickly. And so I can select Measure Jitter Transfer. And at this point, we're measuring jitter transfer. So we characterize the jitter at the output of the device at each of the discrete frequencies. And you can see we're already starting to see some peaking in the device response here. And so we're getting close to the 3 dB bandwidth of the PLL. You can see it's about 2 to 3 megahertz. And we measure the last few data points and we can take a closer look at the results. And so this is a plot which is of interest. Uh, each of these data points is a measured point and then the workbook it also will measure the 3 dB bandwidth uh, and tell us what the peaking is for the specific jitter transfer function. And so if we were making a jitter transfer function compliant to a specific standard, we compare the bandwidth and peaking values to the test limits in the standard to determine whether the PLL passed or failed the measurement requirements. Thanks for taking the time to review the operation of the jitter transfer measurement on the 86100D. If you have any more specific questions, please contact Keysight Technologies. Uh, there's also a very helpful white paper available on our website. It's the 86100C-2 product note, and it goes into a lot of detail on measurement background information uh, specific to making the jitter transfer measurement.